All right, welcome to the KCP community call. I'm going to do this very quickly for the intro. This meeting is governed by the CNCF Code of Conduct, which boils down to be excellent to each other. And with that, let's get right into it. Uh, we don't have any new meeting attendees, so I don't think anyone wants to introduce themselves. Um, I have a couple of topics that I added to the agenda. Um, I think one topic vanished. Um, yeah, I removed mine. Okay. Um, so maybe let's get quickly into what I first had a couple of weeks ago. Um, and basically, I'm just wondering what we think should be the current, like the, the correct way to do things. So um, we discovered in a KCP environment that we were using um, that we get into a weird state. Um, where the API export was, the, the, so an API export was deleted, um, and that basically kind of kills, no, not kills, but the, the problem then basically becomes that a lot of components assume that the API export should be there, um, so things don't work properly. Um, I'm not sure about the error messages, or maybe you should have written them down, but the 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 thing or the question that I have for this group is if you have, well, you have an API export and you have one or more API bindings on that API export, um, what should be the semantics of deletion? Um, if you delete an API, uh, API binding, that's everything's great, resources get cleaned up. Um, but if you delete an API export, which you can do, um, then kind of all hell breaks loose. And the question is, should we basically just fix the, I don't know, controllers or components that, uh, that assume that once an API export is there, it will always stay there? Or should API exports not be deletable when they are actively bound or maybe something completely different? So it's intentional that it's not destructive because you might, change an export, move it, whatever. And movement to, at the moment is not so easy because the reference, the only reference we have is by workspace, right? But there was an idea that you could have different references by some kind of uh, identifier without even knowing where, where the workspace, uh, the hosting workspace is. And then it becomes interesting to move an export. So imagine, uh, I know team A has a workspace somewhere in the hierarchy and they own the export and they restructure and it's now at a different spot. So then you have to delete the export, recreate using the same uh, identity secret and it should just work. That's the idea behind that. Not fully implemented, but that's the basic idea. Okay. And and basically, the, the binding should keep working. So, yeah, they should be self sufficient in a way that you can at least touch your resources and they're uh, still served. So, everything should be resilient to exports not being there. Of course, the uh, semantics is lost because if there's no export, there's no controller. But that's probably fine for temp. I mean, for some some time for the transition. Okay. Uh, but okay. So 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 essentially, what you're saying is that API exports can be deleted because well, you might be like moving them around or something. In between, the API binding should stay on the last known state. Yeah. So I, I could still, you know, request something and uh, see what the YAML looks like and all that. So they don't like vanish, like they're not hidden, but they're still in storage or something. They, they should still be there. And then you could update an API binding to point to another export, which I guess should only work if the identity hash is yes. exact. Uh, is, yes. is this the same, right? Yeah. And I'm not sure this is possible today, right? You cannot change. Can you change the the export in the binding, like the reference? I'm not sure. 
maybe. Uh, I honestly haven't tried. I don't know. And there's a related thing which came up. I'm not sure I get it completely. You can have exports which, um, like, imagine you have a um, some stable export like your your GA export, and then you have a better version which adds another resource. And customers should be able, tenants should be able to bind to either, like either to the GA or to the unstable channel or something like that. And there should be a way to switch, probably, which is then the same thing, right? Editing the binding. And then you get another resource when you go from GA to stable, uh, to unstable. But that's without using the resources itself. You mean swapping it in a API binding layer? Yeah, change the reference export. Same and identity, but different uh, export. Yeah. Just less schemas, for example, or more schemas, whatever. And what what would happen with the resources in that case? Like if the schema changes? That's the same behavior as in CADs. Like it's kind of undefined if they are breaking changes, so they shouldn't happen, the conversion or something like that. Okay, so the, the limitation of well changing API exports, but the identity here should be the same, uh, would not be given in that situation, right? What do you mean not be given? It is, it's the same condition. Like uh, you have to check that the identity does not change. This is unsupported in any case. If you want that, you have to delete the binding and get a new one, which means the CRs, the, the, the resources are deleted as well. But as long as the identity is the same, you have the same owner of the export. And those things should be possible switching around. OK, that, yeah, that, that makes sense. So different API exports would basically be different, oh, different channels that you could subscribe to yeah. and you could switch between. Yeah. Ooh, I, I see a lot of potential for for these you know these undefined behaviors that you mentioned to to bite people in practice. Yeah, I mean switching a channel is a bigger thing, and maybe we we have to think about how to control that. Maybe there's something in the export which defines where you can switch to or something like that. Okay, no. Like, like going to an alpha channel from GA is maybe fine, but going back is not. So. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's going to be funny when you delete an API export, but the API export has the has the rules for this. So how would you then know uh, what you can change and what you can't? Hmm. So the new one has to define that, maybe. <laughs> I, I, I was just thinking if API exports maybe should have different channels. Like if it's basically depending on the channel, you differ, you offer different resource schemas, but it's one, one resource. And then you have another field in the but yeah. this, is basic, this is basically the identity. The identity makes sure it's the same resource. Export is just uh, publishing and a bundle of schemas. Yeah. Okay, I, I think this might need a little, little bit more, more maybe design. Maybe we can think about that at some point. But I, I think. This is this is for me very valuable. Um, I don't like basically how API bindings should react to API exports being deleted, and I think it makes sense um, because you can create an API binding without the API export being there. I think. I'm actually not sure. Then you can you can. Can you create it? 
That's a good question. Uh, usually, these references aren't checked, right? Okay, actually, I don't know. Yeah, there, there, there's a permission check, right? Yeah. At least that must succeed, whatever it means. Probably this works without one. I don't know. Yeah, but, but Airlock also, I think, usually doesn't care if the resource exists. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not sure if the check does. Yeah. Okay, but like, okay, this is still a little bit shaky, but I think this makes sense in general. Um, so yeah, I, I might take a look at, at where the issues lie, um, and then see what we can, what we or what we have to change. Yeah, it might might be worth an end-to-end -end test if we don't have one, just to see what happens. Like the binding should have a condition, probably condition change, telling that something is strange, reference is invalid, but we should be able to, at least to read, probably also to write. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm. I should have brought the error message, but there's something fairly deep mm -hmm. in a workspace being broken. Um, okay. Because it, it it tries to find an API export and and can't see it. So, okay. but yeah. Um, As a follow up to that, while we talk about it, what happens if you delete the binding? Is the semantics the same? The objects are still there? No, this a binding is a, like a CID deletion. This is hard. Like everything is deleted. Okay. So if I accidentally delete the binding and bring it back, then my resources would then be everything deleted. is gone. Yeah, yeah, it's intentional. Okay. As a follow up, we had the discussion in Paris, and I kind of blanking out. We discussed the ways to prevent API binding deletion. When we coming from workspace, oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 and this is the last bullet point in the in the screen, and I kind of blanking out. Like I know Nabarun mentioned that they might push it upstream, but nothing, nothing happened. Did anybody remember what was the way we agreed to prevent the deletion? I don't remember the details. Marvin, where you have you been there? I don't think. Um. Well, I, I'm not on a on, on a white table with Nabo and me and MJ and maybe you. I don't remember. I, I'm I'm not sure uh, if it was. I, I'm also a bit blanking. But wasn't it this topic where we were thinking about a, a, a shadow workspace where you could create API bindings? It's but, a different one. I think. Okay, or maybe it's connected because you might want the bindings be invisible, right? So that was yeah, another one, like findings you want to be invisible. Yeah. But this we had something like annotation or something like that, an admission to preventing this deletion. Yeah, we basically we, we have our reserved annotations already. So I think the question was whether the controllers are administrator, like a system master privileged and if yes then they can set an annotation and we can make that like turn it into a lock, uh, yeah a lock or a deletion protection whatever yeah the, the, there was a pr from nabaroon like earlier this year in march mm -hmm. um but it was only adding a few annotations as you said which is fine uh, for me yeah yeah but i i, I think it was Incomplete. I don't know. I asked about it, but I, I didn't receive a response. Like, yeah. Um, but yeah, so there was definitely something with annotations that they wanted to add. This year. Yeah, it might spin a thread in a channel. I think I, I would like to get something that in place to prevent deletion of because this is very destructive to delete resources and yeah. having the ability to prevent that and I, I, think, like... I think we talked about so the type owner can the type owner add such an annotation and then it's a permission topic obviously but i think our basically in the discussions our escape of this topic was uh, if it's if the controllers are privileged, then we don't try to solve that, or they don't have to solve that. 
Yeah, but the idea was to think that we need to prevent cluster admin to delete these things because yes. we think this is a higher level than a cluster admin. Yeah. Let me try to pin up a thread, maybe tag Nabarun, and if we can flush it out asynchronously, how it is done, I think it's it shouldn't be a hard change. Yeah, the bigger thing about the shadow workspace, I like it because you can store data behind the tenant's eyes, basically. Question is how uh, intrusive such a change is. Like controllers, do they have to be aware of that, for example? But that wasn't the one where, like IBA binding still would be present and visible to users. The, not the, the bindings potentially, but the CID, like the, the resource coming out of that. I think that particular part was bit over my head. How in the current machinery you could That's, put a it's not, in. today it's not possible. But imagine, imagine there would be a canonical workspace or logical cluster name for every workspace uh, for a shadow, like minus shadow or something like that behind the logical cluster name. And the controller which implements the bindings would also look there for bindings and make them available as custom resources in the actual workspace. But then this controller must be aware of this mechanism, obviously. And my question is, how many controllers do we have to touch? Or is this a local change? I don't know. Yeah. And maybe it's only about bindings because nothing else, or all other resources are basically just in one logical cluster. It can be in the shadow if there's a binding in the shadow itself, or things like content maps can be in the shadow. But the binding would be the only one which has effect on both sides. Maybe uh, airbag objects would be similar. So you could give permissions, but uh, it's invisible to the user. And anything custom you want to write to? Like, Like a yeah. James presentation about the namespace proxies where he stores the like airbag stuff in a downstream of clusters. You could do mm -hmm. those. Uh, yeah, this would be another use case, yes. It's doable with some beta, uh, indirections, basically, but yeah, it needs a design. We thought so. Yeah, no, no, that, that, that makes sense. Okay, um, I think this is strictly speaking not the same topic, but similar. So um, I think it makes sense to keep this grouped. Um, maybe, we, uh, maybe let's briefly talk about this. I think it was a topic that briefly came up when we were chatting uh, two weeks ago, waiting for enough people to join. We ultimately canceled the meeting, but I think, I'm not sure who brought it up, but I think there's a CNCF maintainer survey ongoing at the moment. I'm not sure how long it's still open. Um, MJ, do you remember? I just know that it's still open. <laughs> how long it will be, I don't know. All right, I'm also not sure if this is something that's, uh, ah, deadline June 13, uh, 30, sorry. So 10 days. Um, I, da, 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 da. I think this is for individual um, maintainers because it, it asks for your name and information about your employer. So it's not something that we submit uh, or that we, that we submit uh, by, um, uh, by project, I guess, but by person. And I'm also not sure if the link is supposed to be public, so I'm not going to put it on, on the meeting notes. Um, but yeah, if if you're interested in providing the CNCF with some feedback, which I think would be helpful, it's also 
mentioning KubeCon stuff, I think. Um, I think it would be nice if you could check your emails and, and take that survey. Um, I'm not sure if that's... Hmm? No, just paste it in the chat. So it's the... I, I'm not sure if the chat is recorded. Oh, they are being recorded if the call it says. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, if, if you have some time, if you want to give since you have some feedback, I think it makes sense. I'm not sure if there's much else we can talk about regarding that. It's more like a heads up. Okay. Um, then I have another brief topic that I just basically want to quickly talk about. Uh, I've spent some time this morning to add uh, like author profiles to the KCP IO block. Um, and in general, I was wondering, and I'm not sure if it's going to be much success, uh, but I was hoping to extend an invitation, if that's okay to you, to people who are working with KCP in some capacity, so that not necessarily maintainers, um, and maybe write about, you know, something in KCP, uh, maybe in like broad strokes, what they're using KCP for on a conceptual level, of course, because we don't want the blog to be vendor pitches. Um, but in general, maybe say, hey, we have a blog, you know, if you're doing something with KCP, and you can't, you know, actively participate as a maintainer. Maybe you're at least interested in in providing some something, some story as a as a consumer. Yes, that sounds like a good idea. I'm not sure if anyone will will respond to that. Probably not immediately. Maybe probably not in a few months. But um, I would keep that an open invitation if someone wants to blog about something. They're welcome. Sounds good. I think we can send the invitation even to the mailing list. It's been quiet and it would be. Uh, yeah, that's actually a good idea. Send to the uh, KCP users and KCP dev mailing lists. Yeah, I like that. Um, I think that's a good idea. Okay, then I uh, can draft some def, draft draft something. Um, uh, send and then I can send it for review before sending it off. But yeah, sounds like a good idea. Um, then MJ, you do have a topic: KCP Dev enhancements. Review, re reviews welcome. Yeah, so I had one uh, one and single PR open in that repository. So Stefan, you reviewed it a long time ago. I updated it. It's basically retrofitting the mount points for the historical reasons to have that. So if people have time, re-reviews are welcome. I've been playing again these, these days with mount points and this like condition stuff, which some point we talked in a chat, I think it's a nice thing. And I would like to upstream that stuff from my fork. And that's basically an enhancement. That's that. All right, sounds good. Let me. Let me add a review, a re re review uh, mm -hmm. here to my to my to do list. And Marin, maybe you poked a bit the OCI tab, like Oracle Cloud. Should we just give an update about that? <laughs> uh, I can I can give a brief update. Let me uh, let me see. Let me add some notes here. Uh, I just picked up the uh, 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 okay. I can type and talk. Um, so I, I picked up the uh, setting up a workload or like a, a job runner cluster on OCI again. Um, just as a minor note, because I'm not sure we talked about this before. Um, 
the credits are indeed only for ARM machines. So we will only be able to run our jobs on ARM, which honestly, I don't think is an issue. I've been running uh, E2E tests on my M1 Mac, which is also ARM-based for a long time. Uh, so I don't see any issues per se with that. I think we might need to, uh, I'm not sure if uh, we already did that, but the build image, I think, doesn't have an ARM variant yet. So we would need to adjust that and build an AMD and an ARM uh, build image for as well basis for the job runners. Um, but per se, I don't think that's a problem. Um, but yeah, apart from that, I deployed a cluster with my with my Terraform that is up for review in the info repository, but I haven't checked on the cluster yet. Um, so I don't know what state it is in yet. Is that the ones, uh, the same stuff in my pull request stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Your changes are merged already into my okay. branch and then applied. Overall, like I created, we discussed this uh, in like in DM and this is recorded. So uh, in a section on popular opinions, like I spend the half day kicking the Oracle Cloud and their Kubernetes distribution. Like on the bright side, the APIs are well quite built. On the downside, cluster creation takes 30 minutes. If it fails, you don't get any messages. And iterating is very challenging. It's a interesting developer experience developing that when you don't have experience with Oracle Cloud. So it's way, way slower than I expected. But I think we still can get something out of it, like try to deploy Helm, KCP instance, shared one or something like that. But Oracle, if somebody from Oracle were watching this recording, you could really update your examples and uh, <laughs> the X experience. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit trying to figure out how to do things properly. I. I think the Terraforms or the Open Tool stuff actually are using Open Tool for not Terraform um, is is in an okay place, but again, I haven't checked yet. So cluster creation works, but I don't know what the cluster looks like. Um, so I, I'll probably do that in a in a couple of days and see where we're at, and then probably grab Christoph and get uh, get it registered with Prow, and then we can maybe look at at running jobs from there. But yeah. OK. Then I do have one more topic. I wanted to add it to the any other business, but we can also add it here. Um, the Kubernetes 1.30 rebase. Um, I just uh, a couple of minutes ago posted what I could describe as a uh, cry of help in the thread about it. Um, I'm a little bit at a point where I brought everything to compile, um, but I have made so many changes um, and a lot of them were just done by rule of thumb. Like I didn't really understand what I was doing, if I'm being honest. And I'm now at a point where I can start KCP, but informers are not syncing and um putting the like uh, when it tries to update the status of CRDs via the API extension API server, I'm getting a weird error message which suggests or oh, like I've been trying to debug that. It looks like it's trying to do JSON decoding even though it's protobuf in the response. And I'm a little bit at a point where I, I don't know how to proceed because I don't know enough about these internals to even figure out where, where I made a mistake. Um, so I'm not exactly sure how to proceed there. Yeah, I might find time next week to take a look. Not sure yet. OK. So um, the fork is compiling, you're saying, and our KCP is compiling against it. You can start it. It doesn't work. Crashes. I have a, I have a, um, I have a branch 
uh, of KCP on mm -hmm. my KCP fork that is compiling, yes. Okay. Um, it, it currently uses the like a local re rewrite of Go modules, so yeah, it's a yeah. little bit tricky. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it compiles up to the point where I can where, where I can start it. It doesn't panic immediately, but you know th things never never become healthy. Yeah. So, but yeah, this this yeah you you could definitely try this out if you're missing any info from what I've posted on the chat. Um, I'm welcome to to provide more. Have you marked your commits like those where you did changes? You don't know whether they are correct. Something like, I know, in OpenShift, you always mark some of them as boring or something like that. And then needs uh, W, needs whatever, some, some hints in the title. Um, I think at, I, so I was doing the, uh, the rebase of Kubernetes so that was your commits mostly, right? Um, that mm -hmm. I was cherry picking. I think at some point I realized if I'm changing something, I should maybe add myself as a co-author to to show like this is not a verbal cherry pick, but I'm afraid I haven't applied this consistently. I can go over them and see if I can find my changes again. Yeah, um, this would help. Because I think my Kubernetes branch has like one or two of them marked as that. Mm -hmm. Um, where I like really had to like do major stuff. Um, yeah, I, I will I will take a look and see which ones I I had to touch. Um, yeah, and if possible, if you can, uh, basically the the immediate rebase of a commit, leave it as is, and make a commit on top, which shows that there is something important happening. This would be ideal. Anyway, okay. try, try to make it as clear as you can. Yeah, yeah. I I think I might have gone the wrong way by trying to uh, group changes thematically in one commit. Mm -hmm. So basically, when I saw okay something needs to be changed here as well, um, I amended it to to the specific commit because I wanted to keep a complete picture of okay yeah. I don't know clusterizing a specific part. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, now I think that might have been a mistake in hindsight. Yeah, afterwards, it's, you always know better right at the end, but uh, it's hard to know in advance. So, uh, try to find the changes which are which matter and yeah. Yep. Best uh, what, what you can do. Yeah, yep. I'll, I'll take another look and see if I can update my Kubernetes uh, branch um, to, to have this information. And then, yeah, that might help. Okay, then let's 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 stay in touch. Let's see if we can maybe sit down next week. Um, because I like, <laughs> I I I suspect that I did something wrong with the maybe at CD storage layer. Um, but at, at this point, I really don't know. So, if you do a meeting thingy, please include me. I want to sit and listen in silent. More I see things like that, more I learn myself too. Yeah, yeah. Okay. that's good. Some morning next week, we can talk on Monday or so. Awesome, cool, great, thank you. I appreciate that. And I just noticed that Legit left a comment on my context PR, which I'm trying to push for the last two months. I'm gonna try to adjust those two. One more commit if this gets in the drop. Yeah, but he was open, I like that. Like he wanted insurance that Certain things don't happen. So yeah, yeah. I, I wrote some of the tests, and I think he asking now for more tests. Mm -hmm. But now, when I have the framework in place, it's easier. Yeah. Just for for a little bit context, this is the Arbac context something, right? Yeah, it's the the stuff where we keep wiring the 
we have the deltas for the context. It's an easy thing, thing but quite verbose. Yeah, okay. Sounds good. Awesome. Okay. So while we're talking code, so Stefan, remember the thread we had about a generic control plane and a controller for services and endpoints? You saw that same yes. failures yeah. in the tests. Yeah. So um, when is code freeze for, for Cube? This, I mean, the enhancement freeze was just now, I think. Yeah. I don't think that's going to. My, my challenge with that one was that code is in a cube, I think, the aggregation server. Mm -hmm. And my question is, like, is it is in the right place? Can we try to move it to, like, controller managers? No, this is about, yeah, it's a long discussion. It's about the cube API server pinging the aggregate API server, I think. And it should run in the API server because the network matters. Mm. But it's it's a con con controversial thing because uh, there might be three API servers and each of them might have problems to to connect. And then the one which has problems marks the thing as uh, not available and the others are totally happy and might flip. And so that's this topic, I think. Yeah, and I was thinking how, like, basically, we need to disable that controller in some yeah, cases, yeah. like a conditional and this, one. And it could be easy. It could be something in the config which we can override. Maybe it's easiest path is just to raise a PR and try to get a consensus per PR. Because like I, I didn't find a nice and neat way to do that. So I'm just thinking how to best approach it. Yeah, I haven't looked at it. I still have one PR open. Is this related? No, mine is the one for the context, but I need to. Oh, you you have one. No, it's the backward. Step 11, right? No, this is. Oh, yeah, this we should also finish the, the examples. Yeah. Let's, But the examples are not blocking. But the other thing is actually right. OK, it doesn't matter. I think it's a, let's take it offline to find a better way. Basically, that that one controller is missing to have it properly stand alone, I think. Yeah, some flag will do it, I think. OK. One which we can override in the config after applying the options and then in the in the wiring of the example generic control plane we can change that all right do we have any other topic Maybe as something briefly, um, there was a PR related to, to leader elections, um, a follow-up to the thing that we merged, I don't know, a couple of weeks, months at this, I, I don't know. Um, so I just, let me just add this here real quick. Um, I just wanted to briefly talk about that and maybe we can briefly discuss the approach because I commented on it. I just wanted to see if, uh, if you would agree with that. So basically the problem I think was that the indexes, uh, were being added when you created the controller and the contro controllers now gets created every time you win a leader election. Um, so this PR is moving this part out of the controllers and into the 
I think into here, where it basically adds all indexes. Um, in upstream, there was a change recently that you can add them after starting even, I think. I'm not sure which version, maybe in the next one. I just mm -hmm. wonder whether this is like unnecessary when we, when we rebase, could be. Mm, I, I, How does after start help here? Then you can re-add re re them probably as long as you want, as often as you want. Hopefully identifying the same if you add them twice. But anyway, um, Marvin, maybe continue, sorry. Uh, oh, good. I, I was just thinking, so, so I left a comment here. So my concern is a little bit if we add all of them for the, for the different controllers in like this one single file, we're going to lose easily track of, okay, what indexes did we start for what? So I, I wonder, and this is what I ask here, is maybe the controller packages should have um, a function or so to, to do this. So like this year, which I don't know. I like I like that, yeah. Okay. Having a st standardized uh, function, which you can call from one place, but have some in the controller packages, yeah. All right, okay. Then I didn't get feedback on this anymore, but then uh, I know that I just didn't invent this, but that's probably the way to go. That's good. Okay. Do we have any other business? Okay, then I think that is uh, a no. And I'm gonna stop the recording. Thank you, everyone.